Right. I'm going to stay as far away from the lectern as possible because I really, like, I hate being stuck in the corner. Um, I am going to leave my shoes on, though, so if you're expecting a Daniel Spielberg talk, unfortunately, Daniel is not here this year. Um, I'm Brendan McAdams. I work for TypeSafe. Uh, if hopefully some of you have heard of us, we are the commercial entity behind a couple of products, including Scala, Play, and Aka. Those are our three big ones. Uh, we also have a system called Slick, which is somewhat new, but this is our answer to really on the Scala side of things, providing a better way of doing querying and interaction with databases. It's inspired by Link. So, you know, one of the great things is Microsoft has sort of proven this model in .NET. Um, it's based off of Scala Query, which was a previous project by Stefan, who's one of the sort of core contributors to it. Um, I work right now within professional services for TypeSafe. So I spend most of my day on site at customers, helping them do things like deploy these tools. Um, at some point, I'm going to be working as well on integrating some cool new features into Slick, which is what I want to talk about. So how many of you here are familiar with Scala? So a good chunk of you. How about, uh, I mean, you generally, do you feel like you understand functional programming? OK. So that was one of the points of contention when we were talking about doing this talk, was not making the assumption that anyone who's going to know Scala, not making the assumption that you understand functional programming. Functional programming is a big part of what makes Slick work. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that is and what that means. So Slick stands for Scala Language Integrated Connection Kit. At some point, we decided that it was no longer going to be all capitalized, and it's now just a capital S. So that's the right way to print it if you're looking to be in compliance with how we do things. The big thing is I like to think of it as an elegant functional database library. And a couple of you can, can guess the reference here that's coming next, which is that we're looking for a more civilized age. Um, I mean, everyone in this room has probably spent time dealing with things like Hibernate or writing raw SQL or any of the number of possible solutions that we've come up with to deal with database interaction. And the whole point here, I'm not going to play long, drawn out, comparing different products and other things because I think that the tool should demonstrate itself. And so I'm going to focus on how the tool works and what it does. We'll talk a little about comparisons to other things, but this isn't a sales pitch. This isn't trying to convince you that this is better than Hibernate or anything else. It's showing you how it works and giving you an opportunity to think about that on your own. So the first thing as to why we're here and why I'd like to waste an hour of your time, uh, a couple of key concepts. So the first thing is functional data concepts. This is that part that I mentioned, which is I honestly didn't know how many of you were going to raise your hand when I asked if you were familiar with Scala. Not nearly as many of you raised your hands when I asked how comfortable you are with functional data concepts. So what's good is we're going to spend some time talking about that. I'm not going to show you every piece. We're going to start with enough that when I show you examples of Slick, you're not going to sort of cross your eyes and fall over. Um, a little bit of about impedance mismatching, and that's this part where code and data fail to match and fail to meet. That's a little tougher. That's one of those that we've probably all, how many of you have worked with a relational database with SQL in this room? I see most of the hands in the room going up. Um, how many of you have developed a drinking problem as a result of trying to make that interact with your object-oriented code? A few hands. So I mean, the whole idea is, and, and when we talk about impedance mismatch, and it's funny because when I was making sure that the term that was in my head, which is impedance mismatch, was the right term. Because you know sometimes you have that word in your head and you're not sure if it's actually the right term. Because impedance mismatching really refers to uh, signals. There's actually a Wikipedia entry that's specifically described as object relational impedance mismatching that's just all about the fact that SQL databases and object-oriented programming don't match up. And that's part of what it is, is that the way that we tend to write code doesn't really match with this system that we've come up with. And this is something that I think Slick gets us much closer to that. And then really talking about mapping Scala's functional collections to databases. So what I actually want to show you to start with is how I would develop some quick data in Scala, how I would put it in a collection just in memory, just working with Scala, give you an idea of how we manipulate that, and that's that basis for then when we look at Slick, you'll see that it just fits in. The whole point is that this should integrate with the way that I'm doing things. 
So what we aim to solve with Slick is it's a database query and access library for Scala. And you write native Scala syntax. As much as possible, we want all of those things that you've learned with writing Scala, not just to be, I know enough Scala to read the Scala doc and figure out how to use yet another library. Think about all these possible libraries you have where, sure, you might have a DSL on something like Hibernate, but it doesn't, just because you know Java, all that knowing Java taught you to do was read the docs on which functions to call. In this case, native Scala syntax, I mean if you know how to manipulate a collection in Scala, you will know how to manipulate your database with Slick, even if there's a couple extra functions and things don't quite work exactly the same, it gets you pretty close. And so we let Scala generate our data access, and this is especially going to evolve. There's a lot of things going on with Slick and with the fact that Scala has introduced macros that are gonna make this pretty amazing. And this is, um, I played with the wording on this. The reason that there's a hyphen there is that it didn't quite sound the way that I wanted to. But what I wanna say is no more SQL and that you don't have to write SQL anymore. And one of the driving forces, because for those of you who know me, I spent the last two and a half years working for TenGen, which is the vendor of MongoDB. So I've spent a good bit of time in front of rooms full of people convincing them they should move to NoSQL. One of the things that I discovered is that people weren't always moving to NoSQL because there was a particular problem they wanted to solve other than the fact that they were tired of writing SQL and that they were tired of the kinds of problems they ran into. And that's not necessarily a good enough reason to this isn't the right database. And so we can get away from writing SQL without having to get rid of SQL. This promise has been made by things like Hibernate and other things in the past as well, but Hibernate replaced SQL with Hibernate query language. So very quickly, um, Slick 1.0 is out now. It does require Scala 2.10 plus. There are some pieces of it that we're starting to work with macros and other things. If you're using Scala 2.9, the old Scala query, which is what this is based on, is very similar and offers some of the same pieces. But what I'm gonna show you is the stuff that's based on Slick 1.0 what we have with Scala 2.10 going forward. And this is from the fine folks who brought you Scala. So this is a collaboration um, between both ourselves at TypeSafe and EPFL, EPFL being the, the uh, Polytechnic University in Switzerland that was responsible for Scala. There's a combination of team members at TypeSafe and at EPFL who are collaborating on this. And so it is something that isn't just a commercial project, but it is something that is open source and being driven by a number of different interests. So as far as what Slick supports, and I kind of feel like this is ahead of the game and I meant to move this slide around, so I apologize. But real quick, the databases we support. Postgres, uh, MySQL, these are two very popular open source SQL databases, so obviously supporting these is important. Um, we support Microsoft SQL Server. The, the asterisk there is, I, in my past, actually spent a lot of time in finance where I worked with Sybase. For those of you who aren't familiar, for a number of years, Microsoft paid Sybase to build Microsoft SQL Server for them. And eventually they bought the code and forked it, but they basically speak the same protocol. And one of the ways you talk to a, Sybase, a Microsoft SQL Server from Unix is with a library called FreeTDS, which is just basically a Sybase driver. So we don't actually officially list Sybase support, but I suspect it will work based on that. Um, we support SQLite, so we've been playing a lot with these sort of not quite full database databases. H2, um, Derby, and JavaDB. DB. JavaDB is Oracle's commercial version of Derby, and they support it, blah, 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 um, as well as HyperSQL, also known as HSQLDB. And for some reason, Microsoft Access. So all of these things will just work um, right now, the underpinnings of Slick are JDBC based. And you'll see that a little in some of the examples, but uh, that is gonna change. We are expanding out our backends. Now, there are two closed source extensions for people who are commercial support customers of TypeSafe. We offer support for Oracle and DB2. Um, this is something where, because they require support beyond just the basics, we chose to make that something that's a commercial piece. And coming real soon now, which is, this is one of the pieces that I'm working on when I find time, is we're working on integrating NoSQL because the concepts still map. Now one of the fun things here is doing things like aggregation and some of these things where NoSQL databases have gaps. They're starting to offer 
secondary index queries, aggregation, and other things, but not in a consistent way. And we're working on that, probably MongoDB first, but we're also looking at things like Rioc and Cassandra. So let's talk about functional data access. Now, Stefan has done this talk quite a bit, and he's used coffee as examples, and I think because among other things, there are some sun examples of, of doing JDBC where they use coffee. Um, I decided to change it up a bit. I wanted to play with the declarations to be able to demonstrate more of these functional concepts. And these days, I tend to prefer tea to coffee. So I want to take a look at how we might throw some data together with Scala. And it's not the most perfect Scala. It's quickly thrown together. I'm using things that I probably shouldn't have, like enumerations, but at least to give you a basic idea. Most of you in the room raise your hand that you're at least familiar with Scala. So hopefully all of you aren't too scared by what comes up on the screen. Um, and we're working in memory. We're just working with collections of data, like if I created objects and manipulated them. So uh, I've got a couple of things here. I've defined an enumeration that just defines types of T, really based on their color. Uh, I also learned an interesting thing, which is the French tea companies call oolong blue. So, you know, you see blue tea listed, you have no idea what it is. Apparently, that's what they call oolong because they wanted consistent coloring. Um, we've got a supplier and we've got a tea. So, the enumeration is just really the colors of tea, the types of tea. And I had some ideas for these examples to do something more with that than I ended up doing. The supplier is a container class for our tea vendors the name of the vendor, the country they're in, a URL to where they go to. And then RT, which again, I sort of overwrought. We've got a supplier, we've got a, a name, a kind, a size, um, a currency character, and a price. And that was just sort of me playing with, let's quickly throw some Scala together as ways of, of demonstrating this. Now, if we put together some lists, I'm not gonna walk through all of these, although if you ever have a chance to go to Mariage Frere, they have quite fantastic tea. You'll also see me some examples of just how expensive they are. Um, we've got a couple of suppliers defined here. And what do they have to offer? So here's some examples of I went to websites and grabbed some random ones. So Stash is a pretty well-known company in the US. You go into lots of cafes. They sell their tea bags and all. Uh, Mariage Frere, for example, has a white tea that they call white tea from beyond the skies. The 100 grams is 105 euros, a little bit expensive. Um, but, you know, a couple of examples of, I've just defined a bunch of classes, and I've linked in directly my supplier definitions. And a few more just to, you know, keep things interesting and add a couple extra slides. So the question now is how we collect and manipulate the data, and this is this part where we want to talk about functional data access. So creating a collection. It, everyone here, this isn't confusing, you know enough Scala, is anyone already confused? That's okay. So I've defined a sequence that has all of my T's. We have type inference in Scala, which means that we've sort of automatically figured out that this is a collection of T. And I also could have explicitly declared that it's a collection of T, so that if I try to add a vendor in there, we get type errors. So what can we do with the sequence? Excuse me. So first and foremost, we are talking about functional programming, and the emphasis here is on function. If you guess the functions are involved, you're a little ahead of at least where I was maybe three years ago before I really comprehended this. Um, you've often heard these calls lambdas. If you're following the Java world at all, this is a big deal because they're talking about adding lambdas to Java. They were supposed to be in Java 7, now they're in Java 8. They're still arguing over exactly how lambdas are going to work. Um, but lambdas as a concept are really talking about anonymous functions. It's defining a function that's not actually a full method attached to a class, but something that we define in line. It might have closure properties or anything else, but we're not here to talk about lambdas, but they're important to what we're doing. A method, it, by contrast, is defined in concrete. You define a method that takes arguments, returns something that's attached to a class. Scala has this nice capability of if you have something that needs a function and you pass a method, it will do what's called lifting, which is really a fancy kind of casting to change things around. So this is this elegant and civilized part I hinted at. Here's a method just called cost dollars. It takes an argument of t, 
So if you pass an item of t in, it returns a Boolean. And we simply have a method here that evaluates that the currency attached to t is equal to the dollar sign. Anyone confused yet? So this is a method, because with the def, this is something I could attach to a class, and I could you know, use this normally. Now, I've also defined a function. In this case, I've captured it in a variable. And so I've defined a variable called cost euros. And there's a little bit of a different syntax here. This is a function where I'm still taking in t and returning a Boolean, but it's a lambda. It's an anonymous function. And so if I look at that closer, there's this arrow, which I call it a rocket because the glossary of the programming in Scala book defines it as rocket. And Heather Miller was standing over there earlier and telling me it's not called a rocket. And Phil Pauler was arguing with me that it's not called a rocket. So I call it a rocket. It's an arrow thing with an equal sign, whatever you want to call it. Um, but this indicates that it's a function. It's a lambda. That, that rocket operator in Scala is us defining an anonymous method. Our left side here declares the arguments that we need. I take one item of t, and the right side is inferred as a Boolean. Easy enough so far, anyone confused? OK, so we can use this to actually define functions or method that takes functions, which is also known as a higher order function. A higher order function is a function or a method that can take a function as an argument and or return a function. And that's part of all of these pieces, and that's part of how Slick is driven. So for example, filter is attached to most sequences in Scala, where it takes a predicate. So it's looking for me to give it a function that takes an argument of t and returns a Boolean, right? Going back to this anonymous method that we defined. Filter will then return a new sequence that contains only the items that passed that predicate. So I could write a function that I pass in line, t.filter, where you know, the currency is equal to euros. And I get back a new sequence that's only the items, that the t that was defined where they had a currency of euros. I could even pass in a method, and this is that whole lifting thing that happens where if you remember my cost dollars method evaluated where the currency is equal to dollars. And they get back a new sequence. So there's other methods that essentially follow the same pattern. These are attached to most collections in Scala, like exists, where I'm really just asking if any of the elements match the predicate. So if anything in the sequence passes the predicate statement, I get back true. If none of them pass, I get back false. So I could look for any items that are defined in rupees. Since we're talking about tea that's mostly manufactured in India, you might think maybe we've got a supplier there. Apparently, that is the new Unicode symbol for rupees. Um, there was a whole Wikipedia article about lawsuits over some competition for it, too, that I got lost in. The last one I really want to look at deeply before we move on to actually looking at slick is group by. And you'll notice that I'm getting a little more complicated here. So there's this extra type called k. And that's really any type we want. Because with group by, we're now doing a transformation. k is going to be something else that's not what we started with. And so we're saying that we have a function that takes in t and returns something of k. We transform it to something else. And we're going to return a map. So the group by statement, think about how we apply this to a database, is going to group items by a particular thing. So in our statement here, I want to say whatever it is, group them by that and get back a map. So look at how we might do this. I define types of t where I group by t.kind. Now this is this part where I regretted using enumerations because enumerations are a very particular type. And so my k type here is actually t types.color. And I get back a map of t types.color and a sequence of t. So the easier way to do this would just be to call two strings so I get back strings. Much better. This is me regretting my code and deciding instead to just keep going forward. But essentially, k is a string here. And I get back a map of string to a sequence of t. So now instead of just having one big sequence of every type of t that I have defined, 
What I have instead is a map whose keys are the possible kinds, which were white, black, oolong, green. There might have been one or two others at some point. And so if I call tentries.t.groupby, because tentries was the object I actually defined this code on, um, where I use this function, this kind to string, what I get back is a set here. And I apologize, I think this is probably not readable to those of you in the back, is it? But what I get back is a set that contains white, oolong, black, and green, because I've asked for the keys. So if I was to call white on that map I got back, I would get all of the T entries that were white T, green, et cetera, et cetera. Now there's one more transformation that I want to mention. It shouldn't be too complex after we just looked at group by. Is anybody confused yet? Am I trying hard enough at confusing you? Good. Map is very fundamental to, there's a button on my remote that for some reason blanks out the whole screen. And I have no idea why anyone would ever want that button. But at least I finally figured out why my screen blanked randomly, because there was one presentation where I got lost completely. So map is going to give us a new sequence of type B, where B is something that we transform it into. So for every element in our collection, this f, this function, is going to be called. And we get a chance to return something else, to transform it into something. So for example, I might just want to transform it into a list of prices, where I've said t.map, and I've done a string format here. But essentially, I'm saying the currency, a 3.2 floating point format per whatever the sizing was. And most of them, I think, were 100 grams. There were a couple that were 50 grams. And so did I really? I'm sorry. The results are not printed there. But essentially, we're going to just transform it. That what we get back is a new sequence of strings, where the string is actually the pricing behind things. Anyone confused? This makes sense. So let's take a look at Slick itself. Now, with Slick, we don't quite have the advantage yet. And um, you know, as we move more and more towards macros, things are going to become easier. We still have to define our table definitions. But I can actually use this table definition to create my SQL schema. I don't have to write a DDL. So I've defined an object called vendors that extends table. It's gonna, it has a list of all the types that are in it. Because we're in a strongly typed language, we still have to say that our table has these types. We also have this argument, which is what we want to call it in the SQL database. And this is going to go two ways. If you've worked with object mappers before, if there's no database yet, that's what it's going to create it as. If there's already a database, it's important that our names match up with what's there. And then for each of our possible columns, we need to define a column field. So I've got ID that's a column of type int. We are limited somewhat right now in this type of slick definition with what types are valid. You'll notice, for example, that in a second that I had to get rid of my character for, for currency. But we define the type the name of the column, and potentially any options. There is also support for things like auto-incremented IDs. I didn't use them in this example to just make it a little simpler. But in this case, I've defined that it's a primary key. Now, one thing is that every table needs you to define a method called star. This is a projection of all the columns. So this is a tilde operator that binds columns together. And you'll see those projections later in other parts of Slick in how we say, maybe I only want part of the fields that come back. And the definition of the T table is going to be so, is fairly similar with a couple differences. I had to change my kind over to just be a string. The enumeration's not in play. And my currency is a string. So I didn't quite map things exactly how I started with. But there's one other piece here, which is I've defined a vendor ID that's just a column of an integer of a vendor ID. But I can define a foreign key. So at the bottom of the screen here, we've defined a method called vendor that's a foreign key. It's the name of the foreign key. The column in this table that is the foreign key. And the object that defines the table that that foreign key relates to. And then in this case, there's this extra thing where I've said that the ID field in vendors is what we point to. 
So not only if I was to create the table from this code, will that create the foreign key for me, but I've now got a method called vendor that when I have an instance of T, I actually can simply resolve the foreign key automatically, and we'll look at that. Uh, this is a little heavy on the code because really it didn't need detail in too much. This is all within a block called with session. You can create explicitly named sessions. In this case, there's an implicit import called database.threadlocalSession that we use. So everything going forward is going to be defined within this block, which is a session. And I'm just using the H2, which is an in-memory SQL database. Um, there's a whole bunch of, of pieces here about that. But you'll notice I'm calling vendors.ddl. Remember I mentioned the database might already exist, or I could use my table definition to define it. In this case, vendors.ddl will spit out the create table statement for whatever JDBC driver I'm using. And so I've said vendors.ddl plus plus t's.ddl. I think the font coloring came out a little lighter on the screen than I'd like. Dot create. So what I've actually said there is get the create table statements and actually create the tables. And now I've done some inserts. So I've inserted each vendor explicitly. I could, as I mentioned, use auto insert. And if I had, def I'm sorry, auto increment. If I had defined that ID field as auto increment, I can skip that in 